super raw. Yeah. Yes. Hi, Vinita. Hi, how are you? Fine, how are you? I'm oh, good. Great to see you. Good to see you too. Early in the I morning was... for you though. A little early, not that early now. Yeah. Mama was very kind to, uh, you know, schedule it at a reasonable time. Yeah. Okay. So, good evening, everybody. So, we are here to welcome Professor Vinita Dayal. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Subara, mm -hmm. Professor Rajesh Deva, uh, Professor, uh, Professor uh, Shalendra uh, Mohan, uh, my dear colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. I am delighted to be part of this gathering ah, this evening. So nice of you. Thank you. I am very happy to invite all of you to the lecture number 29. I request uh, Professor Shailendra Mohan, oh, he just left. He said he had another meeting. So anyway, so he said he will welcome you, but he may join again. So I welcome all of you to the lecture series Foundation Day lecture series of the Central Institute of Indian Languages. As most of you know, we are commemorating the Foundation Day. Though the Foundation Day was on July 17th, this year we chose to do a almost a year-long celebration because it's in one way celebrating Indian languages because it's a feast for many of the linguists not only working on Indian languages but also on other languages to look into and listen to a variety of topics mostly on South Asian linguistics specifically on Indian languages. I'm very happy to have Vinita Dayal with us. She's not new to many of you here. Nevertheless, I would like to give a formal introduction to her. She has a very impressive CV which runs more than 18 pages. I hope I will do some justice by highlighting some of her important works. Uh, she began her career or her studies, I must say, in English literature. It's very interesting from literature which she did in Delhi University from 1976-78. Uh, 81 MPhil. She did even her MPhil in um, English literature and moved on to Cornell University and did got her master's in 1988 in linguistics. From then onwards, she has been working a lot on linguistics, her PhD also from Cornell University. Her dissertation is on WH dependencies in Hindi on the theory of grammar. Some of our uh, great uh, South Asian colleagues like uh, Jim Geyer and Barbara List were on committee. Her research interests are on semantic theory, syntax semantics interface, Hindi or South Asian linguistics, cognitive science. She has held a lot of professional positions. She began her career, of course, in her home country, our country, India, in the late 70s, in 78, 79, at Delhi University. So I'm sure Professor Subarama and others can recall those days as a lecturer at Department of English in Delhi University, a college affiliated with Delhi University. Then also in other places, she worked in Rutgers University as an assistant and associate professor for quite some time. And she moved to Harvard in 2003. She was a visiting associate professor over there. And from 2018 onwards, she had a long uh, span of time. She spent her time in Rutgers. And then she moved to Yale, where she is currently placed. And she's holding the Dorothy Debold Professor of Linguistics. She at the Department of Linguistics, Yale University. She's associated with the Cognitive Science Program and the South Asian Studies Council at Yale. In Rutgers, she was associated with 
the Department of African, Middle Eastern, and South Asian Languages and Literatures, and also Cognitive Sciences and South Asia Studies program. She has traveled quite a bit, and she has collaborations with different uh, colleagues across the globe. She had several external projects, for example, at the University of Brasilia, Brazil, Mumbai. She is a frequent visitor to University of Mumbai, IIT Delhi. Then also Brazil, she keeps visiting. I can see from her CV, the Federal University of Sao Carlos. Also South Africa, Nigeria, quite a bit. St. Petersburg Institute of Linguistics, JNU, she has been teaching quite, maybe, I think it was in 2010, and also in Europe at various places, University of Leiden, University of Potsdam, University of Constance, Berlin, and many more. Cornell, of course, in the United States, she has been delivering lectures in various places. She has held a lot of administrative positions, mostly in Rutgers University and Yale University. Her fellowships, awards, and grants are more, it runs more than a page with lots of grants. I would like to mention at least one or two grants here. She has been awarded with uh, Graduate Faculty Teaching Award from Rutgers, then SAS Entrepreneurial Program Award for the development of online course in speech and hearing. That's an interesting one. She shared the grant of uh, more than uh, $11,000 with uh, Crystal Lacaze and Kristen Siret. She also developed online courses in social linguistics with Kristen Siret. She has worked with uh, Ernie Lippold, Jason Stanley, and Matthew Stone on um, a center for the universals of thought and language. Of course, she was a Fulbright senior research awardee on, she worked on semantic variation in South Asian languages. She has got a lot of awards. I would not like to mention everything and take away the most important time she has kept for us. Her publications, a huge list again. She has several books. One of the most quoted and in interesting book is Questions, published by Oxford University Press. And also there are other books in preparation. The Open Handbook of in or definiteness, you have indefiniteness, uh, definiteness. Then she has also edited a book with Anup Mahajan, another uh, colleague of ours who worked on South Asian languages quite a bit. She has publications, papers in books, refereed journals, and uh, conference papers. She has more than 60 papers in reputed uh, journals and uh, books like linguistic inquiry. There are many, many language, you can, linguistics and philosophy, many journals. She also has a lot of uh, books on her name and then different projects. She mentioned it during our uh, short chit chat just before the meeting began. She's currently working on an important project on bare nominals. Uh, it's a collaboration on the acquisition of determiners by L1 Mandarin learners of L2 English. She has given a lot of talks, more than 160 talks. I believe this is a 161st talk. And we are oh very goodness. much honored to have you here with us. Like I said, her CV is very, very impressive. And her editorial uh, responsibilities are also very impressive. She uh, is currently the associate editor of linguistics and philosophy and she was the founding editor of South Asia Syntax Semantics Newsletter. And she's a member of editorial boards of highly reputed journals like Journal of Semantics, uh, Natural Language Semantics, Journal of South Asian Linguistics, Semantics and Pragmatics, Natural Language Semantics, Journal of... Then we have Linguistics and Philosophy, Syntax, Linguistic Variation Yearbook, Natural Language and Linguistic Theory. She has organized several conferences and she has worked extensively on a variety of topics on semantics. I am very happy and very much uh, thrilled to have you with us today. I once again welcome you on behalf of Central Institute of Indian Languages, 
and on, also on my own personal behalf to CIL virtually and to India. So that way we are very happy you could be with us this evening and you are going to enlighten us on the topic, the semantics of indefinite definite articles and languages without indefinite and definite articles. I am 100% sure there will be questions on both definiteness and indefiniteness of these things. Looking forward, like everyone present here, to listen to your talk. The floor is yours, Vinita. <laughs> Thank you, Uma. I didn't know what the etiquette is. I wanted to stop you five minutes ago because I felt, oh my God, am I that old? <laughs> I am. But when you get a long CV, it simply means you've been there too long. At any rate, um, I should probably get on with the business of the day. And uh, of course, it's an honor to present to an audience that knows it from the other side, right? Like, um, I always like to talk, if I'm talking about Hindi, it's great to talk to people who are not necessarily Hindi ling linguists who know about the Indian languages. But there's something special you get when you present to an audience that actually knows the languages. So I, as always, I very much welcome any questions, whether they are theoretical or whether they are empirical. I don't think one can, if there's a choice between, you cannot build good theory unless you have good data, right? That's, and data is data, you can't argue with it. Theory is what has to bend to capture the data, right? So that's sort of my approach to these issues. What I am going to talk about, I should share my screen, right? So one second, let me make sure. Window. Okay, you see my screen, right? Yeah? Good? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so basically, when we talk about indefiniteness, that's a very broad term, right? Like there are many ways, you know, we have intuitions about in, indefiniteness. And when I say indefinite, I mean definite and indefinite. But we know that languages vary a lot. But in which domain? So if you're talking syntax, morphosyntax, of course, and the most uh, obvious example of this is that there are languages, in fact, I don't know, half, I always forget the numbers, but a large number of languages do not have any markers of, do not have articles that represent definite versus indefinite. When it comes to the meaning, that's, you know, it's debatable, but it seems like we, we have the expressive powers, right, to convey definiteness and indefiniteness. So is there variation? Or is the variation in to what extent the morphosyntax of particular items lead to particular readings that we can identify as definite or indefinite? So I guess what I'm saying is, in talking about this, we know when we use it to refer to morphosyntactic pieces or whether we are talking about meaning but often the two are intertwined. So I'll try to um, separate where it feels necessary to separate the two. So in morphosyntactic terms, my focus is on the definiteness or indefiniteness that is conveyed by the articles, the and a uh, and in English. And of course, this is what we don't have in many languages. But diachronically, I understand that definite articles have developed from demonstratives and most languages maybe even all languages have demonstratives and the un, uh, the indefinite article has developed from the unstressed version of one so of course languages typically have that uh, numeral too so is there really pressure to have a definite indefinite article or are we able to get meaning across anyway so there are many many questions that one could you know, uh, that arise from this cross-linguistic variation, the picture that we have. The one that I will focus most on is, is that functional space that in English is or languages like English is occupied by the articles, 
is that possible is it possible to cover that space without the articles and how does that happen and are there any is there a systematicity to how this happens okay so the baseline view is that um you know so the first thing is what is the and what is you know what do we mean when we talk about articles and actually even though this is something we all know i'll take two minutes to go over it just because you know when you are faced with a new language how do you know that it doesn't have definite articles right or it does have definite articles and so we need some diagnostics especially when we do field work in a new language or even a language that we know you know we have you should be able to justify on the basis of diagnostics this is what i mean so it's a between demonstratives and definites it seems relatively easy when you're looking at english at least so for example you can point to two books that are close enough to you in same distance and say i like this book not this book so it's possible so the set of books there are obviously more than one book in the there's more than one book in the context and by virtue of the demonstration that is part of the demonstrative you can refer to one or the other and you cannot do that with the you cannot say i like the book not the book right so this is evidence that the definite determiner forces there to be exactly one uh, item that uh, one entity that satisfies the descriptive content so there's a lot of argument whether you really can for uh, build uniqueness into the meaning of the definite article but a diagnostic like this the contrast between 1a and 1b i think settles the question for me okay now when we move to hindi of course we know we have determ determiner like um items like ye and wo but they obviously behave like the uh, demonstrative right so it's possible there's no requirement that there be only one book in fact most natural interpretation is that there's more than one and you're pointing to this as opposed to that but when you look at we don't you know what are the other options if you just say mujhe kitab pasand hai sure that part is fine but you say mujhe kitab pasand hai kitab nahi that becomes a contradiction what exactly do you mean right and so in that sense the bear and p sounds seems to be with respect to this diagnostic like the definite determiner but there is no determiner that we see at least right and the next one this is an interesting aspect to demonstrative that has not been studied as much certainly it's been observed that you don't really use the demonstrative when with what are called the globally unique nouns so you don't say this earth revolves around this sun the sense is what do you mean there's only one earth and only one sun as long as we are talking about you know a solar system the natural way in english is to say the earth revolves around the sun and i think the same holds for the demonstrative in hindi um but the bear is perfectly okay so two points hindi doesn't have a definite determiner but maybe that that aspect of meaning is covered by the bear noun so the next piece of this is what about the indefinite determiner and of course we use ek in hindi quite freely so the question is is that an indefinite determiner it certainly conveys indefiniteness and there are three um, particular diagnostics that we use to determine whether something is or is not an indefinite determiner one is storytelling can you introduce a new uh, character into a story using a uh, indefinite determiner and of course in english we is once upon a time an old woman lived in this house when you use one this a little bit odd in english once upon a time um oh i made the one old woman lived in this house it it emphasizes the cardinality like one old woman lived it's not your natural way of introducing in hindi i think there's some, a lot of speaker variation on this so personally i like to use ek bahut saal pehle is ghar mein ek budhi aurat rehti thi but i know that many people will accept it without ek the point is as far as the determiner goes ek on this count is a good you know it meets the test right it passes the test 
But there are other readings that an indefinite determiner has that ache does not have. So one big uh, one is the genericity test. When you say a cow eats grass, it means the, it's almost like saying cows generally or all cows, most cows or typical cows. In Hindi, you say a guy has charti hai. That's a bit odd. You'd rather just say guy has charti hai. When you use, although this is a very um, subtle difference, but it's very easy for ache to get these readings. So you say, ek mahi apne bacche ko ke liye itna kar sakti hai. Only, only a mother can do such and such. Then ache becomes okay. But garden variety, basic generic sentences, ache does not lend itself to it. And the other big one which will come up again is that you cannot use ache and get narrow, neutral, narrow scope with respect to negation. So if I say I couldn't find a book in English using a, this is compatible with finding no books, right? I, I couldn't find a book. I went shopping. I couldn't find a book. But if you say, Mujhe ek kitab nahi mili, that has a wide scope reading for the indefinite, meaning there was one book I didn't find. You could get a narrow scope reading, but it's an emphatic one. Mujhe ek kitab nahi mili. You know, I spent all this time, I couldn't find a single book. You can get that reading. What you can't get is this neutral narrow scope reading, which says I, I got no books. You could use the bare NP to do that. Mujhe kitab nahi mili. I went shopping, I didn't find books. Anyway, so this also tells, <laughs> this is like I spent five minutes stating the obvious, right? We all know Hindi doesn't have the definite and indefinite articles, but it's always good to get the crowd on your side, right? By stating the obvious. Okay. So what, now, if you look at the literature, the semantic literature, oh my God, there's so much on definite and indefinite articles. And we still keep on talking about it, right? But it's so heavily weighted on the definite and indefinite articles because they are important things in English, right? They're important cues for something. And we know that late bilinguals have trouble with this. So there's clearly something that speakers of languages that don't have articles are missing that speakers of uh, languages that have articles um, can get. So I'll just give the basic semantics for the it's, it presupposes that the common noun set is a singleton in the sing, singular case. We modify it a little bit to get the plural, but it's the same uh, semantics. And after that, if you want, you could just use the existential. So there are two um, ways to look at it. One is to say you have the article the that covers the space when the noun, common noun set is unique. And then you have a, which is um, in all other cases where you don't have um, uniqueness. There's a slightly more nuanced way of thinking about it, which is to say they're both indefinites, but the definite, or they both involve existential quantification, but the definite has this presupposition. And the presupposition is that I'm a singleton set. So in any context where that presupposition is met, you use the... If the presupposition is not met, you use the default. Uh, so that's what gives you this contrast between you. You can't. It's ungrammatical to say, "I see a sun," if you're looking out the window, or "She is a tallest girl here." That's just plain ungrammatical. You need to use the in those cases, but that's because our common ground knowledge tells us that there's only one sun. So uniqueness. So it blocks the indefinite. It's, you know, we can talk about this during question hour. The, um, the point is that no matter which line you take, if you ask the average linguist or the average speaker, how, what is the status of bare nouns in Hindi? You don't have definite and indefinite articles. How do you convey this? Oh, I think most of us would say it's ambiguous. Those of us who are very syntactically inclined would say there is a, we do have a determiner, it's just a null determiner. But the null determiner 
has two meanings. So either you go with it's under specific, you know, no matter which way you go, you end up say with something like, you know, we can either use the def the meaning of the definite as the meaning of the null definite or of the indefinite. So again, we can talk about how different people uh, might think about this ambiguity, but I'll just keep it simple and say, there's the ambiguity view. But what does that mean exactly? So in fact, it is not, um, what, it, what I understand a simple minded ambiguity view to be, take everything that the N can do and everything that a N can do, the union of that, that's the space that bare NPs in Hindi can, a language like Hindi can cover. And I want to say, no, there are some uses of a uh, that in the bare end piece cannot cover. So for example, I'll just give one example here to keep things simple. So this is singular, right? The bache say this is the oblique form. This is the plural. So there were many children in the room. Teacher was talking to child. This is, you know, you you cannot process it as one of the children. Whereas English a uh, can be, into, this is what Ench uh, called partitive specificity, right? So you can say uh, there were several children in the room, the teacher was talking to a child or the teacher called a child up to the front, you know. So you can easily use the indefinite a uh, singular to refer to a, one of the children. You cannot use the bare NP to do that. So that's just one example. On the other hand, bare NPs have readings in this space that you couldn't get with a. So for example, oops. Yeah. Anu do ghante tak chuha pakarti rahi. You can say chuhe pakarti rahi, but ya kitab parti rahi. There are many examples you can put here where you don't, uh, Anu could be reading different books, could be catching different mice. She was engaged in that activity for two hours. There's no uh, requirement that it be exactly one. If you use this is called differentiated scope, right? You take a, an adverb that has um, a kind of a durational adverb and for any relevant uh, partition of that space of that interval, she was catching, if she was catching mouse, then she was catching some, you know, there can be different mice involved. But if you use uh, an indefinite, an overt indefinite in English, you don't get that reading. Anu was catching a mouse for two hours or Anu was catching some mice for two hours means that there's a given one, one individual mouse or a set of mice such that she, was, she kept catching them for two hours. So it's sort of an odd example. It's much clearer if you use kill. So Anu was kill, uh, Anu killed, rabbits repeatedly is fine, but you cannot say Anu killed a rabbit repeatedly because it's a one-time predicate. You end up with some kind of uh, very implausible reading. How can you re-kill something? Whereas Anu teen ghante tak machar marti rahi, no problem, right? So this is the space. This is the, pictorially, this is how I see the, um, the space of indefinite definite determiners versus bare nouns in Hindi. So what is this space? So what is the alternative? My idea, and I think, you know, I apologize to those of you who've heard me talk before. This is one of my hobby horses. I've had it like when I, the very first talk I gave in my, uh, well, no, the very first talk I gave actually, Subha Rao was there, was on correlatives, but almost the next talk was on bare nouns. These have been my two, go to things. And the idea is that they're kind terms. So I want to, yeah, before I uh, get to kinds, I want to just pause for one minute and say, you know, we are very driven by wherever the work starts, right? Whichever language is the language that is first investigated. And since the theories that I'm working with started with English, it's only natural that we have been influenced in our way of thinking about, you know, trying to analyze this from the perspective of English. And English happens to have 
these two determiners, Prager Russell made, you know, put at center stage. But what if Russell and Frege had been born in India? What if they had grown up speaking Hindi? Would they have focused so much on the definite indefinite articles? And I like to think that maybe not. Maybe if we hadn't been so focused on this, we might have been more focused on the fact of this distinction between kind terms and ordinary, um, you know, kind and instantiation or kind and object level. So, of course, a um, one of the most natural domain for uh, uh, that we talk about is the ordinary domain, the dog that we see outside or the, you know, the child who we can look at. Those are object level instantiations that belong to a subordinate category or an intentional category, a more abstract category, which is the kind, the type, right? And interestingly, every language has the ability to, to talk about both levels. We, it's part of human cognition to want to make general statements the, about the class as a whole, as well as about the particular um, instantiations of that class, right? The thing that is really interesting to me is, you know, languages, people, there are lots of there are lots of determiners. There are lots of different determiners. Languages vary. How much would it cost to have one more determiner that was meant for kinds? So every language wants to talk about kinds, make statement about the kind, but no language actually has a determiner that is only used for kind terms. Now, I say this and I must add immediately that no known language. We don't know. Maybe there's another one coming up. But we have been looking at this, uh, th this issue for some time. And to me, the absence of this is telling. It tells us something about natural language, um, how we think about these two domains. So one is that it has no, uh, there's no dedicated determiner for kinds. And relatedly, the ways in which we express kind terms there's variation of two, exactly two things. Either we have used definite determiners or we use the bare noun. And this holds even to some extent for languages that do have definite determiners. So we'll look at it in a bit, but I like this, you know, it's sort of nice and uh, the big one is the kind and the little ones are the instantiations, right? Okay. so. How do we know that we speak about kinds or that a now particular noun phrase can lend itself to kind reference? Well, there's some uh, predicates that are kind level. You could not apply them to an ordinary individual. So being endangered, being an endangered species is not something that, you know, any one of these tigers has. It, it's the class as a whole, right? So, of course, in order to be endangered many of them should have died out the the predicate requires make some reference to instantiations that there aren't too many instantiations for example or that they have died out most of them have died out similarly extinct does depend on the status of the instantiations but in fact it's not about you couldn't talk about a particular tiger that oh that tiger could become extinct so these are predicates that tell you we need to have reference to kinds. And what we see is that here's English that has definite determiners, but doesn't use it. So, you know, there is this idea that you can only get reference if you have D. I, I'm not going to argue against that. Basically, what that means is then we can use a null D even in English, right? That's what we would have to say for this. But you can actually use the definite determiner. It's just that you switch to the singular. So almost, synon almost synonymous, not exactly. You can say the tiger is an endangered species. The tiger could become extinct. And then you can also make generic statements about tigers generally. Tigers have stripes. The tiger has stripes. Uh, tigers roam freely. The tiger roams freely. So English allows for two, one with the determiner, one without. But when you make generic statements, so the definite determiner is used, but not the indefinite determiner for kind reference. And how do we know that? We can say 
tigers are an endangered species or the tiger is an endangered species, but not a tiger is an endangered species. So you can make generic statement. A tiger has stripes, a tiger roams freely in the wild, but you cannot say a tiger could become extinct except on a taxonomic reading. That is one type of tiger. But if you're talking about tigers generally, you have to go with the definite or the bear. And this is an important point that I think often gets missed, that we are a little bit, um, it, we shouldn't look at generic statements to decide whether a particular form is capable of kind reference. Okay, so now we get to the, is there a difference between the bear plural kind term and the singular kind term? And the answer is yes, even though so far, I was giving you examples where they look synonymous. Well, there's, you know, again, if we have time during questions, we could go back to this. But the general view is that the singular kind term is more res is restricted than the bear. Bear plural, you can just make up anything you want. Houses with red roofs and yellow windows are displeasing to me. You can make any kind of generic statement, but you cannot do it with all um, with the singular one. So you cannot say the three-legged tiger is widespread in this reason, re region. If you're entering some data, you can say, oh, Rutgers professors seem to be born on weekdays. But if you, it's still in that context, you can't say the Rutgers professor seems to be born on a weekday. It almost seems like a requirement to be, you know, and it's an odd requirement. But um, there is a sense in which they're the same, which is conceptual plurality, right? You can say lions are widespread, lions surround, which, are, which is a collective predicate, or gather. You can do that even with the singular predicate, uh, sing, with the definite singular. You can say the lion surrounds its prey. Obviously not a single lion, right? The lion as a class. Or the lion gathers near acacia trees. And again, this is a group. So conceptually, yes, we think plural, but grammatically, no. So you can say dogs lick each other. So you take any pair of, you know, your typical dog, your canonical dog, you take a pair of them, one licks the other. That's what each other requires, a plural and, you know, a part of the uh, noun phrase. It has to pull out a plurality and then it has this reciprocal relation. It cannot do that with the definite singular. So you cannot say the dog licks it, each other or the unicorn has horns because then it says one single unicorn has more than one horn how is that a unicorn etc so these are grammatically distinct of course the interesting thing is that you know they're distinct on you're looking at english the distinction is at two levels right there's number the on number and the on over definiteness marking um well, I'll just say this briefly. The difference that will be important for us is the difference between plural terms, which allow for easy movement between semantic movement between the kind and the instantiation. So you have these two operators, nom and pred, and you give it a kind term, and then you can go to the instantiation if you need to. This is blocked for the singular one. So if you have the definite singular, I want to block it from coming down to the individual instantiations. And the analogy is, there's a nice analogy with the collective nouns like committee. Um, so if you say committee members will meet at 10 a.m., the committee will meet at 10 a.m., they sound pretty synonymous. But you cannot say the committee members like each other. I'm sorry, you can say the committee members like each other or live in different towns, but you cannot say the committee likes each other or the committee lives in different towns. So it's similar on the kind level. That's uh, basically what I want to say, that once you form a group, this is Landman's um, account of these uh, terms, then you can't go back in and pick at the atoms or the formance of the plural term. And something similar is what I'm saying for the kind, uh, singular kind. Um, okay, I still have 20 minutes or so left, yeah? Okay, that's good. So what are these singular kind terms? So the plural kind term is simple. You take a noun phrase, uh, 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 sorry, NP, not DP, a 
common noun property, if it's a plurality, if it's sufficiently general, regular, you build on it and you make a um, you you build on it and make a kind of the kind term through this operation called norm that we will look at in a minute. What about the other domain? So then um, there are two ways to look at it, right? One is to say that the definite article is ambiguous. It can do kinds or it can just do what we associate with definite readings, which is pick out some unique individual, right, in our context. The line I took was that it's not the that's ambiguous. It's the noun phrase that is ambiguous between appealing to kind term, to this taxonomic level and to the ordinary level. Ordinary level is when we say the child, we expect there to be exactly one child in the context, right? Well, the way I was looking, the way I was looking at it, and I still hold on to this idea, is that, look, what is a taxonomic reading? A taxonomic reading simply says there are types of different things, right? So any determiner in the language can have a taxonomic reading. You can say one lion is endangered or two lions. Sometimes you want to put in two types of lions, but often you don't. And if every determiner can have this reading, doesn't, isn't it parsimonious to say, then what about the definite article? Why not that, right? If everything can have a tax taxonomic reading, it would be costly to block the, how could we even block it, right? What would we say? So let's say we have taxonomic readings and taxonomic reading means, you know, this, uh, kind of a picture where you have a uh, mammal and that is a taxonomic uh, category that has mammals like dogs, lion, whale, etc., etc. And then the lion will have different types of lion. This is a taxonomic hierarchy, right? And what does it take to have a taxonomic reading? If I say one lion, then I'm looking at this set and I'm saying one of them or two of them or all of them, every lion is in danger of becoming extinct. What would the mean? The would mean that it's the unique element in the set of like elements that has that property. That is, we're talking about mammals, I can say the lion, meaning the only individual at this level that satisfies the lion property. And if you, so that's my, the basic analysis. And the point is, you're using the same iota that you are using for ordinary definite noun phrases, just applied to a different level. So I'm saying noun phrases can vary in their domain, i.e. be ambiguous, not the determinant. And what does this predict? This predicts that in English, we use the, uh, the definite determiner, but in languages that don't have the definite determiner, Iota can still be used covertly, either as part of the null D or as type shift, whichever way you want to think about it. So I think, yeah. So two types of kind formation. This is for uh, plurals, English bare plurals. You get, you take the predicate. If the predicate is of the right type, you intentionalize the definite reading. So whatever in, give me any situation, it refers to the whole set. So this is an intentional uh, version of the definite determiner. This is the iota, which is based on ordinary individuals. This is iota applied to the taxonomic reading. So these are the two that we have. And so I guess what, uh, so wrapping up this part of the talk, what I want to say is we, if we even just look at English, just one language, we get a lot of information about reference to kinds versus indefinites. Mm -hmm. But in English, the variation is on two counts. There's the number, they differ on number, and they differ on overt expression of definiteness. Okay, mm, let's see. So here's an intro. I'll throw this out before I, we go back to, to Hindi. So there are some, like I mentioned earlier, that to me, it's really interesting that we do not have a particular 
a determiner for kind reference, even though kind reference is ubiquitous, every language in it, it's a universal property of language. But what we do have are various ways that vary between having being bare or being definite. So Hindi, bare plural, bare singular. I don't have to give you the examples. You, you know what they would be. In Italian, both have to be definite, the plural as well as the singular. And in English, you have bare when it's plural, but definite when it's singular. What is interesting is we don't have, at least so far again, attested any language that has the does the plural the way the Italian is done, definite plural, but the singular the way Hindi is done, very singular. So it's not really mix and match, right? If let's say, okay, we grant you there's something about the way kind are formed that doesn't involve, that builds on what you already have, namely definiteness. But sometimes you don't have, you don't need it. You can do it covertly or overtly. Well, then you should get mix and match, right? You should, this, this type of language should also be possible. But in fact, we don't see that. So let me see. Yeah, so why? I'll give just briefly, I already mentioned um, why we do not have anything other than bare and definite. It's because kind reference is really, if we go with the what we have been looking at, is built on the definite meaning. It's an intentional version of the definite. And then the second part is, why don't we have this combination? And the reason is, remember, bare singular kind terms are formed by using the basic meaning of the definite determiner. So how do we know a language has a definite determiner? Because it's used to refer to pick out unique individuals in the context, to use it anaphorically, et cetera. So what, I'm, what we are saying is it's the same definite determiner just applied to the taxonomic level. So you can't have a determiner that applies to this domain for to pick out the individual ordinary individual, but not if that individual is a kind individual, so to say. Okay. So there's still other pieces of this generalization that bears probing, but I think for present purposes, this suffices. And I think with this background, now this is the thing with the, the virtual format. I have two screens, so I actually get to see some of you, which is nice. But, you know, when you're presenting in a... <laughs> In person, you can read the audience in a way that you can, you know, so this would be the, I would have said, interrupt me, or I could still say that people don't do it. <laughs> so, um, so I'll just keep going. And hopefully in the, you know, things that aren't clear will come up in the question period. So now from this perspective, so now we have embraced the idea that Russell and Frege were South Asianists. They started looking at bare nouns and, they, oh, they started with the kind reading. What can you say about the definite, indefinite readings at the ordinary level, right? Coming from that perspective. So the general thing I'll say again, this is open to, you know, discussion, is that most, for the most part, the space that the definite determiner covers in English is covered by bare nouns. And I'm saying Hindi bare nouns are basically kind terms, but that's pushing it a little bit. Um, let me, let me, oh, sorry. Okay. So there's a general availability of the definite readings. And there is a reading, indefinite readings that we get. I mean, there's a reason why people say it's ambiguous, right? It's, there are indefinite readings that we associate with bare nouns. But the point that I was making is that they're very narrow scope or if you like non-specific indefinite reading. So there's the definite reading, there's narrow scope, non-specific indefinite readings. And then this is true for uh, bare plurals, the narrow scope part, everything. But in terms of availability, the subject object asymmetries with respect to indefinite readings for singular bare nouns, but not for bare nouns. So there are some caveats here and there, but 
um, it's always good to make a claim that people can challenge. So I'm putting it in these bold terms. Okay. All right. And what's the theory that I will assume? The theory that I'll assume is a theory of type shift. Now, type shift has a bad name, bad reputation among syntacticians, because the feeling is, oh, type shift is like a, you know, what used to be the pragmatic waste. But anytime you don't have an account, oh, that's just type shift. No, I think, so there are two things I want to say. Type shifts can be constrained, and I want to constrain it in a particular way. The second thing I want to say is, Positing a null D doesn't solve the problem. You still have to have an account for what that null D means. So if you believe in having a null D for all reference, that's fine. The problem um, that I'm posing or the, the challenge of capturing these readings just gets transferred to deciding how do you determine the meanings of those null determiners. So it can, whatever I say, if the, if it captures the, if you think, okay, I can see why this would capture this set of data, but how can we get away from having D? I would say you can transpose all of these ideas onto a null D, the semantics of null D. Okay, so the idea is the following, that certain type shifts are simpler than other type shifts. So norm and iota, definiteness is simply the predicate just put it all together, right? It applies to the predicate as a whole, everything in it. Of course, it has may have presuppositions and all that, but the idea is that it is it, it does not bring in quantification. Whereas indefiniteness of the full-blown kind, partitive specificity, wide scope, etc., 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 involves two things. It involves shifting the changing the kind, uh, sorry, the type of the noun phrase but also carving out pieces of it. And so this idea that when you have a bare noun, you can shift by a norm or iota more easily than with the indefinite. So of course, in English, this gets clouded because the and a seem to be a pair, though um, I think syntactically, there have also been proposals that, that they're not both in D, but without getting into that, semantically, we can make this distinction and say this is, these two don't compete with each other. And I think this is true that in most languages that don't have definite determiners, you get both definite readings for bare nouns as well as kind level readings for bare nouns. Okay, plural kind terms have narrower scope readings. And that's because once you have a plural kind term, you can easily come down to the bare noun, uh, sorry, to the instantiation level. But the operation that gets you there is an operation that locks you into narrow scope readings. I'm not giving a lot of the details here. It, it's there in my papers and we can talk about it because I'm mindful of the time a little. Um, sing, so, okay, so let me see. Maybe I'll go to this and then come back. So this is about plurals and kind terms. So as far as kind terms go, whether you have the plural or the singular, both are possible or the singular in English or in Hindi sometimes requires sort of a lecture mode. It's not casual speech. I think bare, bare plurals are more common than the definite singular. But if, if you can imagine a lecture about mammals and, you know, a zoology lecture, it's very easy to go to the singular kind term in English or in Hindi. And then as far as definite reading goes, the difference between English and Hindi is simply that English has a lexical determiner. So there's some kind of a blocking effect which says, if you have a lexical determiner, use that. Don't use covert. Uh, so the uh, counterpart in English would not be grammatical. But the Hindi one is completely acceptable. Kamre mein kai bache the. Teacher bacho se baat kar rahi thi all the children, right? That's the reading. So it's, oh, sorry, I didn't, this was, this is a mistake. This should be, the teacher was talking to the children. That was a copy and paste. Um, and if there's a singular antecedent, then it's perfectly fine to say, kamre mein ek bacha or ek teacher, ek bacha or ek teacher the. Um, I guess that's how it would be. But the important point is teacher bache se baat kar rahi thi means the child that was in the room, right? So 
Time terms and definite readings do not differentiate between singular and plural. They're both possible. And so that's the two um, first parts. This is the interesting part. And I tell you, it took me forever to figure this out. Um, Hindi allows, there's, this is the subject to object asymmetry. And what's the explanation for that? So when we get here, if you look at the object position, then both the plural and the singular have narrow scope readings, right? Anune e kitab nahi karidi. We know that's not good. It, it's the wide scope reading. But anune kitab nahi karidi, kitabe nahi karidi. And we can make many more examples. You get the narrow scope reading. Here's another one. Uh, anu do ghante tak kitabe parti rahi. There could be one or many books. Anu do ghante tak kitab parti rahi. Again, there's no uh, single book that she kept reading, right? But once you add, so this is in object position, it's completely acceptable to have the singular or the plural with this narrow scope reading, indefinite reading. So of course you can get the definite reading, but that's not what we're looking at now. Once you add a determiner, you lose that, right? Anu do ghante tak kuch kitabe parti rahi. Now there's a set of books and for two hours she kept reading those. Or... So without the, uh, the determiner, you get a reading that's really low scope. And, you know, there's a way to get the time term to lower all the way down. And you get this kind of an indefinite reading. So this is a kind derived indefinite reading. But when you are in subject position, there's a difference. So you know, if you're teaching a class, people are strolling in, you could say, Vidyarthi uh, andar aate rahe. But if you say, Bacha andar aata raha, it, it's an odd sentence. It means the child, there's a single child who came in, went out, came in, went out. So you lose that kind of narrow scope indefinite reading. So what is this, what is the reason for that? And you remember, we talked about English singular kind terms not having easy access to its instantiation. So we don't get down to that level with the uh, singular kind term. And that's the explanation for why 19 is bad with that reading, right? This one, this. In object position, and this is something that kind of is interesting to me, that, you know, we, we know of incorporation for, we've known it since the 70s, right? But we people talked about incorporation in relation to languages that show it morphologically. So Greenlandic, you see the noun inside the verbal spine, and then you see that it gets marked as intransitive, even though it's transitive in some sense, right? Thematically, it's transitive. But then late uh, Tara Mohanan had a paper on uh, incorporation in Hindi and um, she was still following a little bit the old line that it's N, incorporation of N inside V. But um, later, Diane Massam had this, uh, this uh, paper on pseudo-noun incorporation. What pseudo-noun incorporation says that you can get, they don't have to be syntactically fused, but only semantically fused. And that's what I will, uh, I propose for Hindi that these readings that we get in object position for the singular, you can tease it apart in many ways, which I haven't done here, just to keep things, uh, I'm, I'm just giving the punchline, so to say, instead of the full arguments. It's because of pseudo incorporation. And pseudo incorporation, the ways in which you can identify them, but I think it's very, very standard. You know, I won't say it's not a universal. So English really doesn't have pseudo incorporation of this kind. It has it in certain um, corners. So you can say she's at school or meaning at her school or he's in jail. You have the bare singular and that meaning is different from saying he's in the jail. So if you're a supervisor or a prison guard, you can be in the jail. But if you're in jail, then you're incarcerated, you're, you know, a prisoner. So there are these telltale signs for incorporation that Hindi does meet. And so I think 
I think I feel fairly confident in saying you start with kinds, the bare singular can either be a definite without going to the kind level, or it can become a kind level. But then from kind levels, a singular kind level, it cannot come back to the ordinary individual level easily. And therefore, the only place you see indefinite readings are when it is when it's right next to the verb, no case marking, and it can get incorporated. So I think that's basically all I have to say. I'll just give one final, what is the takeaway? Well, all languages that lack definite determiners use bare nouns to refer to kinds. And therefore, to understand the behavior of bare nouns, we should start with the theory of kinds. And this will guarantee definite readings. So it will cover the space of what we take to be the definite readings, but only a subset of available indefinite readings. So what the, the big uh, empirical carving out is the space covered by indefinite determiners, noun phrases headed by indefinite determiners, that cannot come from kinds. That comes from being an indefinite determiner. OK, I think that's it. Uh, thank you. Should I stop sharing my screen so I see? Uh, yeah, for a moment, you can stop and if people want to go back to your examples. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So thank you very much, uh, Vinita. So for your excellent talk, I know you can go on talking on this topic indefinitely, but we have to stick to the definiteness of the reality also. And it, I'm sure there are a lot of questions. It was interesting to know how you have... Uh, taken the baseline from English and extended it to English. And also, you also gave away a takeaway so that, uh, in fact, reduces my job of summarizing your talk. So now I formally open this talk for discussions. Please feel free to interact with the speaker. You can either ask questions or put your comments in the chat box. Just feel free. Yeah, Professor Subara. Yeah, Vidita, I have a question not related to your topic directly, but it is connected to your topic. Mm -hmm. My question is, for example, Jo Araha hai, Mera Bhai hai, is different. Mm -hmm. Jo Sota hai, Wo Khota hai, that is generic whoever sleeps. So on yeah. one hand, you have a definite reading. On the other hand, you have a kind of very indefinite, generic reading. Mm -hmm. okay. How do you connect this with your kind of determiner analysis that you're doing? Because why I'm asking is there is a specific, uh, this one. Mm -hmm. In many languages, we use reduplication of a relative pronoun to express indefiniteness. Jojo जो 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 something like जो जो आता है हाँ जो जो सोता है वो खोता है so right. that means here a mm -hmm. simple relative pronoun is equivalent to a reduplicated relative pronoun this mm -hmm. happens in Telugu Tamil in all these languages mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. can I extend my question a little more or you yeah, want, yeah, to, yeah. You want I mean, to say well, something and then I can ask some more no uh, Uma is the boss what should I do <laughs> no 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 the floor is open please feel free yeah. Go, go ahead. No, I, I, while I, if it, yeah, no. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm, you know, that one of the families that I work on is the Tibeto Burman languages. And there is a sub branch called the Kuki Chin languages mm -hmm. where free relatives, they don't have a relative pronoun, Tibeto Burman languages as such. It's not an mm -hmm. indigenous um, um, phenomenon mm -hmm. the process that they have. So they have mm -hmm. some kind of device that they have to follow. Basically, they have, you know, no externally headed or internally headed uh -huh. relative process, but no relative pronouns. So how does a language, let's say the cook kitchen group of languages like Mizo, the name you are very familiar with, mm -hmm. possibly. So what they do, they repeat the verb, the embedded verb or the embedded adjective the embedded mm -hmm. negative or the embedded adverb. Okay. Mm -hmm. But they do not repeat the functional categories such as tense, 
aspect etc in the embedded mm-hmm. so by that they get this indefinite interpretation right, right. okay Oops. so i think mm-hmm. maybe i should stop here and uh, i want you to react okay yes so well, it's a wonderful lecture re- by the way i enjoyed it immensely so Thank you. you delivered a similar lecture in delhi university too if you remember sometime ago. yes yes yeah this has been one of my hobby horses right yes. <laughs> we, <laughs> we yes. have only few things to sell we keep packaging them differently and selling no, 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 the no. same you have, you have ideas um so yeah no so my uh, there are uh, so let me parse your question into two pieces one is do we exhaust what we mean in intuitively by indefiniteness by just looking at the noun phrase and clearly not right i mean mo- so part of your question did have to do with noun phrase which was the correlative kind of construction mm-hmm. and in the correlative construction i feel very strongly that it gives us evidence of this hierarchy of um type shifts let's say that you get definite rather than indefinite readings so jo uh, you you had the one example was jo waha hai wo mera bhai hai yeah. right so there's you would the most natural translation would be with a definite right the person who's there is my brother and that fits in now of course that individual if the tense becomes generic you get an indefinite reading in that in the sense that since we are talking about different situations you know people sleep jo sota hai people who sleep right that's the reading we get but in a way we are quantifying over situations of people sleeping so the uniqueness part gets diluted or the definiteness part gets diluted but technically maybe it's still there it says for every situation that has a unique individual in it that sleeps that individual you know loses etc so genericity can make this difference even with definite noun phrases right the person who does works hardest mm. is the person who succeeds mm. right it's not about any particular individual so that's the attributive referential kind of difference that genericity can help with the other point you were making so the point there is genericity and definiteness can collude to give you the effect of indefiniteness but really what you're getting is non specificity in some sense but i don't know that it's really you know this is the trouble right in we can talk about indefiniteness intuitively or in semantic terms in many different ways any time we don't get a strict reference to an actual individual we kind of are willing to go with the indefinite idea right so intuitively mm-hmm. but i think we want to what i want to separate is indefiniteness in terms of not knowing the referent or for allowing for variation across situations to a kind of indefiniteness that actually assumes that there's more than one individual in a given situation but the reference is to a subset of them that's the one that i think bear nouns don't have mm-hmm. the second part of your question I don't have a real answer but I do want to say something is about reduplication. I mean reduplication is amazing, right? I don't know a lot about it. One thing that I've noticed is so there's this uh I think Uma mentioned it. I have this project on seven mm. languages that I'm looking at. None of them are languages that I had previously worked on because I did not want to taint of course I have my perspective, right? But I wanted my collaborators to feel free to go so they we administer the set of question, you know questions diagnostics and try to get the results from that and what i found was languages that don't mark singular plural on their noun phrase and maybe some of the northeastern languages are like that so it's capable of plural let's say it there's a sense in which something is unmarked it's capable of plural reference people often talk of reduplication as making it plural or optionally plural and mm. what we found was that in well i only looked at seven languages so what do i know but they they are very, it's not really optional plurality they typically bring something else with them so in quechua for example when you have this optional marker you end up with some kind of variety of like if you say i bought roses you can use the singular 
uh, on mark sorry but if you bought roses with the special marker it means you bought different types of roses of course a plurality okay. but so it's sort of you know natural language is beautiful right like yes. you don't just do things randomly i you don't just have a, an optional why why would you have an optional plural marker you might as well put it to good use so you know i'm just saying like i would love to see what there is but i don't have a specific what i feel like what i am saying about the noun phrase can go along with something else and give us more complex results ah. yeah yes uh, mary you, do you want to ask the question yourself mary thought has a question yeah should i look at the chat or should i what is this uh, mary are you there uh -huh. are you seeing oh, so yeah, she has uh, asked a question. After that, we'll take Jay Sheelan's question. Okay. What is your, what is, this is Mary's question is, what is your opinion of standard Bengali or Bangla descriptions, or perhaps more prescription in this case, of using the disappearing classifier system in an English-inspired article system? Calling classifiers articles on saying that non-bare nouns are therefore definite? Hmm. Okay, so there's some presuppositions here that I wasn't aware of. So is it, I'll tell you what I don't know, right, is um, that the classifier system is disappearing. I did not know that. And that, okay, so maybe I'll tell you what I think I know about the Bangla classifiers. I don't think I can give a really competent answer to this question, but this is what I understand that you have, let's say you have two classifier book, right? In Bangla. So do I forget the to, do, do ta, or anyway, that has indefinite readings and it has the full range of non-specific specific readings. But when you say boy do uh, to classifier, that gets a definite reading or a specific indefinite. That's what I have argued against. Uh, Subara, you wanted to say something? You're muted. You're muted, muted, muted. You're muted. Subara, you're muted. Anyway. I was saying that I lost the, my connection, so I have come back now, but I missed part of your answer. Maybe we can discuss it later. Ah, okay. okay. So the point of uh, the question that I don't, I don't know that it's article uh, English inspired in a kind of negative way. Maybe the terms we use since we are talking, you know, the theory that we are looking at is English centric. There's no denying that. But it does not mean that we would just, imp English doesn't have classifiers, right? Mm -hmm. But we have good semantics for classifiers. And that is prompted by the languages that have classifiers. But of course, what we do know is here, here or this is the way I operate at least, this is what we know about English definite, indefinite, you know, noun phrases. Does the Bangla classifier uh, order noun classifier uh numeral yeah noun numeral classifier does it behave like the, the english more like the english definite or more like the english indefinite so in that sense yes we are using um the article system of english to make precise predictions or categorizations or descriptions but if if the, the Bangla noun phrase does not have a particular reading, just because English has that reading, you know. So like Subha Rao's examples, I don't know. Does English, nobody has found a way to talk about correlatives that are inspired by English exactly, right? The, the inspiration for, from English was conditionals. Well, that was rejected 30 years ago, right? Or 40, I don't know how long I've been working now, but I don't think that we just look at there's it's very uninteresting.
to take an egg, uh, a, a, an account of something in one language and say, here's another language that has behaves just the same. Okay, great. But that doesn't forward the knowledge that we have about languages, right? And so the advantage in studying languages that don't have English determiners is to look at how do they do this? What are the alternative mechanisms to convey the same meaning? So the functional space, maybe we say, oh, it's not covered. And then we can say, maybe that's not a very important you know, thing to convey in language. Or we say, yeah, but here's an alternative way to get that same effect, right? And that's the line I'm pursuing. So from that perspective, um, you know, Tanmoy's work was very influential in um, this. What does it mean to have the noun come first in Bangla? And he showed that that was, did not have non-specific indefinite readings. And I have argued that it's actually a definite reading, but that's that's what linguists do, right? <coughs> Learn little things. But I think the general idea that we we are trying to figure out how Bangla covers that space, that's I think legitimate um, in your inquiry. I don't know if I answered your question, but that's my um, take on this. Thank you, Vinita. Jay, you had a question. Yeah, <coughs> I was. Uh... <coughs> Could you say something about reduplication, which is yeah. very important in many languages, especially in Dravidian? And mm -hmm. uh, uh, Rahul Balasu and I have a paper on mm -hmm. the use of reduplication for distributivity. And uh, what, what yeah. is the question? I was asking? I think it was like Jojo. Mm. It's like. Uh... Yeah, Amrit Sir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Amrit. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, so I was thinking that you know you don't do this in Hindi like ek ek kawa, but in in our mm -hmm. language, and you say that uh, ek kawa is of course indefinite or whatever, but ek ek kawa is some cow, some crows, okay? Right. And Jojo has that distributivity. I thought like whoever. So in Hindi, only the j word seems to do this. That's. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, so it, actually it does bear, now I'm thinking people have been talking about dependent indefinites, right? Uh, so many, mm -hmm. uh, so every, I think in Hungarian it has been recorded, right? Every student read one, one book, uh -huh, uh -huh. right? It, yeah. In Hindi it doesn't quite work the yeah. same way. The so languages differ a little bit, but there is some distributivity that uh -huh. comes in with this kind of a dependent Yes. With may reduplication it's an interesting question is there a single thing that all reduplication does even in a in the same language or is it that it makes possible ways of dividing up the space that mm -hmm. without reduplication it would have right mm -hmm. um and and therefore let's say if it goes if you reduplicate a verb you may get distributivity of the kind mm -hmm. Jay, you were talking about in the sense that, you know, it let's say it would be like every every two hours, like there has to be more than one such event, right? If you mm -hmm. add the read. When you do it on the noun, the way uh, Amrit, you were saying, then maybe it has to have more than one type or, you know, mm -hmm. the, what's the difference? What dhire chal rahi thi, dhire dhire chal rahi thi, there, there it's, yeah, we get the intuition, right? But yeah. no, I think I, I was interested that in Hindi, the only the, the J word seems to do it. Yeah, J does Jojo as a karta hai. You don't say oh, oh. <laughs> you see, you right. see, oh. yeah. yeah. Whereas in Dravidian, you do get it with WH words, but you get it with numerals as well. So with numerals, yeah, yeah. I don't know it's if in Hindi you say ek ek bar, but we say it. No, that means yes. every child. Yeah. Okay. Every child, each uh, one. Right. But kabhi kabhi versus kabhi, is there a difference? Or ek bar versus ek ek bar, is there a difference in mm -hmm. Hindi? Uh, I I think that, so. Kabhi, kabhi waha gai thi. Some time that I don't quite remember. Mm -hmm. Main kabhi kabhi jati hu. Yeah, this is clear. Yeah, it has to be perfective, and you know, I go, 
at mm -hmm. times. Yeah. So there is a plurality piece that comes in, and mm -hmm. but what exactly that plurality targets that mm -hmm. seems to vary a bit. Mm -hmm. Right. But again, there has to be more than one event. Different, different. Yeah. Right. So that's yeah. the plural. Then mm -hmm. you can say in each, you know, it's like each person comes up, each child comes up, mm -hmm. leaves. It's, it's so the distributivity of on a plural domain is here on the event side, right? Mm -hmm. But but the trigger is on the noun, AK, mm -hmm. right? Rather than on the verb. It's kind of interesting. You know, Vinita, this mm -hmm. AK brings in some specificity. Oh Johar Johari AK Kire ko Dekta Gaya or Tsunta Gaya. Yes, right. selected each, each diamond. There's a set of uh, diamonds, and you are diamonds. bringing a specific one that That's is to right. be selected, right? Mm -hmm. So, very mm -hmm. interesting. You know, these are, I wish yeah, more yeah. work is done on, in this area. You know, maybe you can include it in your project. Oh my God. <laughs> 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 I have five or 10 years left. I don't know how many. <laughs> you have another, what, 35 mm -hmm. years left. <laughs> oh, <yeah>. sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. Anyway, what I'm saying, don't forget Tibeto Burman because especially the mm -hmm. Kukichin languages, they are fascinating. You know, and you yeah, get marvel at the way language is structured when I see the advantage. Of course, formal theory is very good, but at the same time, the way these languages are structured, the way they express their uh, uh, the things. Oh, I'm simply flabbergasted. I think it's a blessing yeah. to be working on these languages. <laughs> I'm happy to with Munda languages. Yeah, yeah. No, I'll. Can I say um, if there are no uh, questions, can I just chit chat about something? I want to share this. Uh, this uh, I, so I love empirical work, right? All like my theory is always empirically to me. That's important, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm not a field worker actually, so mm -hmm. I, I don't. Uh, you know, if I have a question, I'll, I'll go look at various languages to see. But this project that I'm doing, I wanted um, I wanted to choose languages that I hadn't worked on just because I wanted to understand really what is the range of variation, right? But I did not choose a South Asian language, even though I know that I know nothing about Tibeto-Burman languages, but the world, other syntacticians and semanticists will not know that. And they... So I just wanted arms, you know what they call arms length when you're doing promotion and tenure. So I chose these languages that, you know, are not my languages, so to say. But then what I realized when we would I would work with my colleagues, the first three, four, five sessions, like even though it was so targeted on just, you know, five or six properties that I was interested in. You really have to figure out how the, what is important in this language, right? Like, what is its own system a little bit, even, even when it comes to just the noun phrase. And once I would understand that, then I could apply the diagnostics in a more, you know, maybe I'm, I still miss something. But I, so th this was the collaborative part because they knew that system. I didn't know the system. So what I'm saying is, you know, Tibeto Burman or even Dravidian languages, how much do I know about those things, right? I, I've picked up some information on Dravidian languages, on Tibeto Burman, much less. So I would love to work on that, but for me, it would be that would be the point, right? Like, first, I would, as you're saying, they structure things so differently. Once you get to the, once you get to what do you say that, how exactly was cut? You know what the pinch you get the you know how to twist the screwdriver then then you can apply these diagnostics and then you can see what is common across languages and what is really what is specific to this language that tells us about other languages right mm -hmm. to me that that's the interesting part the two-way information right, good, good. right. Yeah. And what are the languages that you are working on if i may ask yes yes so totally randomly chosen um Can russian you? which uh, russian i'll tell you why i chose russian <laughs> although i will be very happy <laughs> yeah russian because 
you know, I made some claims about bare nouns that were challenged and are still being challenged in Russian. So I wanted, so I have two, uh, um, Marsha Polinsky and uh, another student uh, I met at one of these schools. So that's Russian. That was the one that was most familiar to me. Kosa, oh my God, it took me forever to understand how that system works. Kusko uh, Quechua, Hiaki, Indonesian, another fascinating language. Korean, on which some of these things uh, do exist. Some, you know, they, some of these other languages did not have, do not have much semantic work on that. And then the last one is Cape Verdean Creole. And what makes me very happy about it, this project is that all my collaborators are experts in their in that area, right? I I purposely chose people who are who have street credibility, right, for that as syntacticians mostly. And I did not choose any semanticists because I really want my diagnostics to be something that people who are not semanticists can use because semanticists can do it themselves. They don't need me, right? So in each case, I felt happy that the people who had worked on that area said there are things we, we had never looked at it this way. So, you know, looking at it from the semantic perspective tells me this about, so in Quechua, for example, the person Liliana Sanchez, uh, you might have heard her name, she's a syntactician, but she works, uh, so she's a Spanish speaker, she knows Quechua, but she works with a native Quechua speaker who's an education, you know, she's an educator and she be, you know, she's working on language revitalization. And so it was a very interesting, I'll, I'll end quickly, just chit chat, right? Um, we were working, so we would meet the three of us on Zoom and then Liliana, I would say something in English, Liliana would translate it to uh, Spanish so that Jeanette could understand that Jeanette would mm -hmm. say something. <laughs> so it was a very interesting. But oh. Jeanette is very ha happy because she says, you know, when I'm teaching Quechua, now I understand how to link it in a way. So plurality, for instance, or the fact that the subtype idea is so important. So, you know, it makes me feel good that theory can help in other ways too, right? Not just us, to, you know, if you're a theoretician, you just love all these things for the sake of the theory, but that it can actually help people see things in their own language. So that I'm very, I'm enjoying it. It should come out this year. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions or feedback? No, I just wanted to say that uh, if you need more native speakers, please write to us and uh, me and my students can help you. Don't make those offers because we will come after <laughs> you. Should, <laughs> you will be inundated. <laughs> but thank you, Ludmila. Thank you. Enjoyed the talk very much. Yeah, yeah. We enjoyed the talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any, other, any other This was great to see everyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Any feedback or comments? Minister, so, where can we get some of your recent papers? I put them mostly on my website. I have uh, I've been very good posting everything. Okay. Yeah. Okay, if there are no other questions, I would like to just make one small uh, observation. Made mm -hmm. the suggestions. I think uh, uh, I would like to uh, draw your attention to Matthew Dreyer's work. Yes. Uh, on yes. Balls. He has two uh -huh. chapters, as you know. I don't remember yes. the number of the chapters, probably 37, 38, something like that. Yeah. Because yeah. I know it was in the middle, in the beginning of the volume. Right, right, volume. Right. 2005 mm -hmm. volume and uh, see because we were talking about articles but uh, since you are having a project right now with seven languages and I believe you will extend it to other languages I was uh, just uh, looking into the criterion what uh, Matthew had uh -huh. as you know very well uh, he worked more than six uh, like on 600 plus languages 610 yes. or 20 something like that 620 uh -huh. maybe. And there were some five categories. Uh, he classified languages into five categories. For example, there are languages, especially after listening to Professor Subarab, 
like there are of course languages where you may not have a definite word but you may use a demonstrative in the place right. of uh, definite but also maybe a demonstrative word or there are languages which has which have distinct uh, demonstrative like english and you have a distinct definite article and mm -hmm. languages which have only one like a definite affix in his sample i think that was the like the definite affixes were about 92 languages the largest in his sample of course was definite word distinct from the demonstrative which is like 216 languages and mm -hmm. also he came out came across languages at least uh, 45 in his database which do not have definite article but have indefinite article this is interesting because yeah. we always assume that there will be languages which have definite article and not indefinite but of course the reverse is also possible so i was wondering and also there are languages which use the word for one like amrit was pointing out that oru oru like the same kind maybe there are languages which would use the uh, number one to specify mm -hmm. or indicate indefinite article so i was just wondering what would be your thoughts on this yes so thank you um of course you know, the way I presented my talk invites these questions to which I don't have expert answers, but I'll hazard, I'll give you my, my perspective on that. So, you know, there are languages that have demonstrated, the reason I gave those diagnostics, if it's a demonstrative, of course, that a demonstrative has definiteness, right? Like, but there are subtle differences between a definite determinant and a demonstrative, which is why we say that there's this development. So I the so I call my handbook uh, a hitchhiker's guide. You know, no matter how many languages you you explore, there'll be more languages, right? That won't fit exactly. So I try to give what would be the real difference. And none of the languages that I looked at actually, you know, what people intuitively have called demonstratives actually behave like demonstratives when you apply the uniqueness test and the anti-uniqueness test. So none of them really allow that that uh, sun is revolving around. On the other hand, when it comes to indefinites, a lot of people have said that, def, you know, you have definite articles, but not indefinite. You know, yeah, you may not have indefinite articles, like in the ache is not an indefinite article. But you get you get quite far with, you know, you when you say it has indefinite readings, people mostly mean narrow scope um, novel entities, the ability to introduce. And that, you know, the numeral has. So English one, uh, English uh, has apparently developed from the unstressed one, right? So now, of course, in English we have, when you use one, it only has the stressed meaning. Otherwise, you use a. Uh. But in Hindi, let's say, we can say, ek ladki aai thi, do nahi. So you have the stressed version, but ek ladki aai thi, uske saath ek aur ladki thi, no problem, right? It's it's really like, oh, uh, just by uns having it non-stressed. But then to see whether that has become an indefinite determiner, that's a te technical, you know, you would apply that and see whether it it really can do the narrow scope, etc. And it might, right? So in English, it's a different word, lexically distinct. But Spanish, it's the same word for one as it is for a, uh, right? Or another way you could say that one has evolved into an indefinite determiner in its unstressed form. So either way, it could it would work. And maybe there are other tests too. So. Matthew Dreyer's work is important. In fact, one of the nice things that has developed in semantic theory, I would say in the last 20 years, 25 years, is the cross-linguistic work is really informed by typological work, especially like Haspel math or Dreyer's work. So there is more of a, you know, semantics had a bad rep, but it really came late onto the linguistic scene, right? I mean, we're talking the kind of semantics we do started in the 70s. So it had a little catching up to do when it came to cross-linguistic work. In syntax, we were already looking at parameters and whatnot at that point, right? So this 
in semantics, it's semantics. It started in the nineties, um, asking the question: Is there variation, or how much variation is possible? But that kind, the kind of you know, explicit typological work, the kind that Subara was mentioning, or you were talking about, you know, Tibeto-Burman languages. You need that to form responsible theories of variation, but then the the theories of variation also allow you to ask some more questions, right? Or probe corners or aspects that would otherwise. So I think that's a really nice development from the semantics perspective. And the more that can, more people that contribute to it, the better. So. Yeah, thank you so much for your excellent uh, interaction and for the fantastic talk you delivered. Thank you, Ma. Thank I, you for giving me this opportunity. It, the our, next best thing to being there, right? Yes, yes. I I hope we will get a chance to invite you physically to the Institute. So I, I really take this it. opportunity to thank Professor Vinita Dayal from Yale University for taking her time out and to be with us on a Thursday morning for her. So sweet of you to spare your time and thank you for uh, agreeing to deliver a talk and for your patience actually because I do recall like you were very busy with so many things when I approached you in July you said you can only make it at the end of January but again I'm glad at least by mid uh, Feb we were able to get you so thank you so much on behalf of the CIL and on behalf of the director CIL and colleagues who are present here. Thank you. And I also thank uh, professors Shubharao, Jay Silan, Shuram Sharma, Lyudmila, many others who had come. And I also saw that we had actually, we had a uh, audience, though the number was less, but there were representatives from all the four major language families. We had oh, people nice. from Sota Bhaman, Australia, mm -hmm. I saw Sarah Lindof, who just left and it would be uh, nice uh, i'm going to circulate this to different universities like i told you so people may interact with you and if you can share us uh, share with us your handout i will so send it to you asking that so i can mail it to them so i, I thank you once again for being with us and for accepting our invitation mm -hmm. i thank the audience for being with us for almost now an hour and a half Thank you and have a lovely day to those of you on the other side of the globe and a lovely evening to the Indian friends here. Thank you so much. Yes. We'll meet Thank again. You. The next talk is by Professor Subarao. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your questions. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for being so kind and so generous. Bye-bye. Thank you. Hope to see you sometime once this pandemic is gone she just left anyway lovely to see all of you so nice to be all with all of you so we will meet again on september sorry february 23rd professor subarao stock yeah yeah sunuram ji ludmila ji yeah. boris ji sabko namaskar namaskar 23rd is a holiday in our country sorry it is a holiday in our country why it is army day, the day of defense or something. Oh, defense, yes. You can make more bombs. <laughs> okay. The whole world is going crazy with these bombs, you know. Which bombs? It's so sad. People are dying of starvation and we are making more bombs. We are not making bombs. <laughs> Discussing this definiteness problem. That is a see, that's a definiteness problem. So yes. <laughs> interesting. Yeah. Uh, Sumiram ji, kya khabar hai bhai? Janab, Sunar, Sunuram ji.